Good morning, uh, Your Excellency, honorable guests, and ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming to the first uh, Mongolia update in Australia. Now, I've got uh, the honor uh, of uh, uh, introducing our first speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Gangbol Davadorj. Um, Dr. Gangbol is an economist. Uh, he received his uh, uh, doctoral degree uh, from the Moscow State University. Uh, and then uh, he uh, uh, was uh, a lecturer at the, um, university, uh, at the Mongolian State University, sometimes it's also called Mongolian National University. Uh, but uh, uh, from uh, 1990, uh, uh, he has been uh, more politicians, uh, as he himself expressed. Um, um, so he was one of the leading uh, members uh, uh, of uh, the democratic uh, 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 revolution uh, in 1990. As uh, uh, we all know, 1990, Mongolia has uh, uh, introdu had introduced uh, the uh, democratic political system, and uh, uh, that system actually uh, was uh, very much uh, initiated by a number of uh, young academicians, and uh, uh, that includes uh, Dr. Gangbold. And uh, uh, he, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, he was the first uh, deputy prime minister um, uh, of the uh, new political system, and then he was. Uh, he also served as the deputy mayor of Olamater City, and so he has been in many uh, uh, important political position, and he has been constantly in the in the parliament. So he has a good uh, uh, knowledge uh, uh, to analyze uh, the Mongolian. Uh, uh, economic policy and the challenges Mongolia uh, has been facing. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a really great pleasure and uh, honor for me to have this opportunity to be here today and to make some uh, speech and uh, maybe general introduction about situation uh, in Mongolia. Uh, I don't know whether how much uh, do you know about our country, but I couldn't get some direct internet here. And if necessary, you can see here just a general <laughs> picture of Mongolia on the globe. This is Mongolia, just located in between the two countries. We are landlocked. We don't have any direct access to the international easy routes and seaports. And how far Australia is, it's uh, unseen from here. Okay, it's just for your, for your imagination. <coughs> uh, first of all, I also would like to thank our host. Australian National University uh, for their warm welcome and hospitality. Uh, there were times uh, my country was, uh, was not here beyond our borders. Uh, the times when Mongolian economy was so dependent on a single market, the former Soviet Union. Uh, at the time, the Soviet Union accounted for 85% on our foreign economic relations, and so named the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance. It's also named it's an international organization for socialist countries, um, uh, excluding China. Uh, as a whole, accounted for 97% of Mongolian economy. Since the transition from socialism, the Mongolian economy has changed dramatically over the past 20 years, both politically and socially. For 300 years before its transition to socialism, in the early 20s, Mongolia had been one of the most backward countries in the world. Mongolia had an early feudal, natural economy with a communist regime in its most rigid and most intolerant form. 
this reign of totalitarianism uh, with its economic analog central planning lasted for the lifetime of the three generations. And this uh, could not be, uh, not but uh, leave deep imprints in every sphere of our society. But these extremes of isolation and repression have only heightened the determination of Mongolia for change. Therefore, during the past 20 years, following the transition from socialism to democracy, Mongolia was able to establish a multi-party multi -party political system, conducted six consecutive parliamentary elections in parallel with the inauguration of presidency, uh, and uh, has formed a parliament in its true meaning. It's very rare that a country has been isolated as Mongolia, not only from the seas, but also from all major international routes. Our only immediate neighbors are, as I'm um, uh, trying to show there, uh, neighbors are Russia uh, in the north and China in the south, the two powers with the greatest uh, physical parameters in the world. As a member of the WTO and as a um, trading partner with the other countries of the region and beyond, Trading logistics is carried out only through the lands of our two neighbors and mainly via railway system because we don't have any other access to the international markets. During the past 20 years, conferences about Mongolia were based on the transition of our country from communism to democracy and discussing general macroeconomic reforms such as privatization, maybe institutional reforms, legal reforms, political transitions and maybe sometimes the, some cultural and just general ethnographic aspects of our country. Today's topic on Mongolia have become more rich and diversified and have allowed us uh, to tackle more specific and sensitive issues concerning our economy, maybe every day's uh, political life. Every country has its own plan of development and ways of economic progress. The methodologies of development are based on the country's historical background, its land and climate condition, its culture and tradition. During the past 20 years, based on the above characteristics of our nation and its economy, Mongolia has achieved and developed its short and long-term objectives uh, several times uh, and strateg strategies for its economic growth. I would like to formula, formulate uh, some of the objectives of our country as established in relation to foreign investment and the mining sector of Mongolia. There are first uh, mineral explora exploration and mining. Use of uh, large scale, scale mineral deposits for export to generate profit and in the long run explore and uncover new mineral deposits. Export finished products overseas rather than raw goods for more value added revenues. Secondly, energy sector. We're in serious shortage of uh, safe and secure domestic source of power necessary to carry out all the planned mining activities and further processing of the extracted minerals. All the ma major mineral deposits are located in the rural areas where new power sources and water supplies will have to be developed. Just by the way, even today we are 100% depending on Russian import of oil products, gasoline, fuel, and everything else. Third, infrastructure and supply chain development. Additional support networks are required to sustain a secure supply chain, extensive development of railway route, highway, Networks and bridges are crucial for us. The supply chain networks must have access to the neighboring countries, Russia and China, and uh, main export ports. Unfortunately, most of our raw materials cannot be exported via um, air transportation particularly. Maybe sometimes except gold and other very rare and very high-valued products. Fourth, human capital. To develop each sector, we need an educated and knowledgeable workforce. This requires internationally qualified education system that facilitates specific fields of study, 
such as uh, vocational degrees water supply, in, in, in sector of water supply, engineering, and others. Plus, government management is required on all levels of this education system. Unfortunately, today's situation is almost uh, three quarters of all our students are students in the humanitarian sectors, journalism, legal system, maybe economy, economics, etc. Unfortunately, uh, in the sector of the real economy, we have very, we are still facing very big shortage of the uh, internationally accepted, high educated people. Implantation of the above goals depends on certain factors. Therefore, let me give a brief details on some of the most influential factors in implementing the above mentioned objectives. First of all, the geopolitical factors. In terms of uh, multinational company competition, there are always supporting government's interests behind these companies, and no country is an exception to this matter. Russia and China, our direct neighboring countries' interests, are more feasible and direct in regards to Mongolia, while other third countries, particularly Korea, Japan, US, maybe Australia, are more indirect and sometimes even invisible. About Chinese interests here. It is the interest of China to secure as much raw material sources as possible, uh, whether it is in Mongolia, Nigeria, or in Chile. But more closely, Mongolia is obviously a much closer target for China. So, <coughs> so it is understandable that Chinese would like to see Mongolia development develop its infrastructure due to the clear demand for raw materials in China for the next few decades. It will desire everything that Mongolia can produce, whether the products are raw, processed, or value added in some cases. Russia has been a Mongolian traditional partner for many years, both politically and economically. It has recently joined the APEC as a Pacific Economic Council, since they would like to develop their resources in the regions where they are located, Far East, Siberia, etc. Russian economy is based also on raw material exports. We have many similarities in this field with Russia. Therefore, recently Russia is becoming a competitor to Mongolia, since both countries will be producing the same products, raw materials, in the next few decades also. We for instance, once Tawun Tolre and Oyu Tolre starts products and initiates its supply to China, the future economics of Russian projects may start becoming less attractive than before. Hence, here, hence there are hidden influences and perhaps interests by the Russians to delay and progress in relation to production in the mining sector of Mongolia. About the interests of the third countries, indirect influences on Mongolia by particularly Japanese, Korean, American, maybe even Australian governments are largely driven by the interconnected interests between the parties involved and how the outcomes may affect Mongolia and the other parties. Therefore, implementation of any large projects will be wrapped in various interests, sometimes powerful, of the countries involved. So let us not be naive to assume that end of the Cold War means the end of competition among the powerful countries. I would like to say certain words about the global economic conditions also. The chain reaction caused by the economic recession in the United States, European Union, and the slowdown in Chinese economic growth is still having lingering and very real effects on the global economy. This is no exception to Mongolia as well. Uh, cyclical natural, nature of the global economy has taken effect also. East Asia and Pacific region has also been hit hard, but the global recession and uh, despite the environments and progresses, we are still far from the high, uh, highs uh, we saw in 2008. China is mentioned 
had undergone a rapid uh, decrease in its economic growth, and since they are Mongolia's biggest consumer of raw materials and main revenue generator through mineral exports, we are seeing the effects on this recession in Mongolia as well. Due to our small-sized economy and high dependence on global commodity fluctuations, we are left at the mercy of this large shift around the world. Therefore, any large foreign company operating in Mongolia should take this matter into consideration. I'm sure Australia is very well informed about this uh, different aspect of these uh, problems, and so I will not uh, dwell upon this topic too much. Uh, our domestic situation. Mongolia is a, a country that is still going through a post-transition period from socialism. We have never had experience in implementing a globally significant project in Mongolia since recently. Some maybe mention Erdenet, the first and largest copper plant in Mongolia, uh, established in early 1978. But the company was developed under full supervision and control of the Russians during the communist time. Second is the uh, Ulaanbaatar Railway Company. It was also a major project in Mongolia, but was also under the strict control of the Soviet Union. The company was established in 1949. Just a few years ago, this company celebrates 60 years anniversary, and now it is 62, 63 years anniversary. Therefore, Mongolia had no say, no say in the decision-making processes and had no gain from the revenue allocating as the project was implemented right after World War II. Moreover, Erdenet is a very opaque company with a very specific and non-common interconnectedness with the global markets, its practices, and experience. More recently, Oyu Tolgo and Tawan Tolgo, the two largest copper and coal mining sites respectively, have become one of the biggest projects we have had to tackle during the course of the last few years. Hence, the general public is having strong reaction to this project as such undertaking concerning critical mineral deposits such as gold, copper, iron, coal, and rare earth attracted a great deal of international and geopolitical interest in Mongolia. This is why Mongolian public is facing an undefined issue undefined issue on whether natural exploitation under foreign investment is as beneficial for Mongolians as it is to the foreign investors. Secondly, Mongolia is one of the few past communist countries that is attempting to implement multiple economic, political, and social reforms. Hence, very often the government has a very poor records of maintaining consistent policies. Sometimes uh, the reason for this is democracy itself, because democracy brings opportunity for every single individual, which means sometimes there are people of various backgrounds, education levels, and beliefs in charge of important decision-making stages of the country. In addition, because Mongolia is such a young free market practitioner, we have no proceed, uh, precedence in establishing commercial, uh, commercial relationships with, and we have not had time to develop and gain experience in these important matters. <clears throat> the roost of planned economic policies are also having lingering effects. For example, many Mongolians, including four top-ranking politicians, believe that obtaining a 51% ownership in any project is the ultimate goal and ultimate guarantee of success, while there are so many other crucial factors that need to be taken into consideration. Perhaps these are the leftover effects of leftist Thank you. This is why our country needs experience, management, and ability to raise funds 
from foreign countries, especially with an increasing rate of investors. As greater the number, the more complicated the issue becomes. Also, although not a great issue, language barrier is a problem. Countries who speak English have no need to think about this matter, particularly Australia. Many times, language is seen as a technical issue and not necessarily an economic one. For a country like Mongolia and based on its uh, population size, it takes approximately five, maybe 6,000 individuals to make critical decision in regards to our country. And of the five, 6,000 people in Mongolia who make these important decisions, only 20% are bilingual, where the rest of the 90% knows only their mother, mother tongue. For example, in Hong Kong, majority of the citizens speak Chinese, language of one billion people. For example, some maybe would mention the Switzerland with a also very small population, six, seven million people. But 80% of the population of Switzerland speak German, French, or Italian. This means that all these people have direct access to huge amounts of information from various kinds of sources. But for majority of Mongolian citizens, they have limited access to various sources of information due to their language barrier. Plus, uh, information available in Mongolia is incomparable to the ones written in English, both in terms of qu quantity and quality. Therefore, in order to make adequate and conscious decision in regards to numerous different issues concerning our country, particularly mining and any other sectors. Mongolia needs more time and additional efforts. To sum up, we need the citizens of Mongolia to be well educated and knowledgeable in order to balance the contradicting interests of both domestic and international parties. In addition, it's important for foreign investors and venture capitals looking to invest in our country, pay a great deal of attention to all of these above mentioned factors. Thank you for your attention. And if you will have any questions, please, I will try to.